Hello, this is Mike Lively and this is Professional Paper Vision and today we're going to build a carousel. Now before we get started, I want to show you some good references from the book. So let's bring up the chapter. And uh, this reference here is Seb Delisle. Seb Delisle is the master at building particle systems. And as you know, I will try to turn a system into a particle system if I can. And here's his website, www.sebdelisle.com. I want to make sure you visit that and take a look at some of the cool things he's doing. Now, he works for Plug-in Media. And what I love about his work is he's doing gaming. And I'm in education. And the goal there is to build 3D game-like environments. And I've certainly got a lot of great tips and good code from Seb's site. So make sure you visit it. Another great uh, reference is Keith Peters on Amazon. Keith has actually written two books in animation. I want to make sure you get those because uh, he's just got some great code. And we're actually going to be going through one of his sorting systems today as we talk about the carousel. So let's take a look at the code. So we're in Flash CS4 right now. And before we go through the code, I want to make a quick point. Here's our carousel, and it has 12 panels rotating around a radius and there's an acceleration based upon where the mouse is depending on which side you roll the mouse your carousel will follow but I want to show you what it looks like without sorting so we're going to get out of this and go down to line 61 of our code and in line 61 of our code we have this looping method this is our animation method and in line 61 we have the sorting uh, method so I want to comment that out so you can see what happens to this code when uh, you're not sorting. Okay, let's save this and run it. And look what happens as you accelerate around the carousel. And this is what happens when you don't sort your objects. Basically, this should be behind. It has a smaller Z, but it's showing in front because it's on top of the display list. So now let's go back to our program and go through the code. We're going to walk through the code now, line by line, and uh, point out what's important in writing this code. Here you have your initial imports, a display object that you're going to put uh, your carousel panels into and spin that display object. You have a sprite, a stage, and a vector 3D. Now that's important because we're going to work with uh, matrix methods to determine our Z values, and that's part of Keith Peter's code. Next you have your uh, carousel panel number, which is 12, and that all important particle array so we always want to try to treat a system as a particle system because you can run it more efficiently that way and so we basically stuff all these panels into a particle array next we have a num variable that we're going to use to count our particles and we get to the last one we're going to start our on frame listener so next create your sprite and you want to have a panel radius that basically is uh, the radius that your carousel is and you're going to place your carousel around. So we use a little bit of math here to calculate where our panels go and how they should be rotated. We'll get to that in a moment. And then you have your center and that's where you're going to center your carousel at based upon stage width and stage height. Let's get to the for loop. Now in this initial for loop we're actually going to add all the panels to the stage. I want to take a little time to explain the math to you. First thing you want to do basically is to instantiate a panel or plane and we just make a sprite and then we draw it and we add in random colors and uh, when it's filled we add that to display object we're actually going to rotate the display object that makes things easier because as opposed to the previous particle code we actually had to tick through each particle to make it rotate around a torus here all we have to do is just rotate an entire display object we have this angle here and basically what we do is we take the number of particles or our planes and divide them to 2 pi and that gives us an equal segment of 12 around a circle. So if you take a circle and you just basically start dividing it up into 12. 12 places that you're going to put your panels. And I'm not going to draw it perfectly but you get the idea. Now in this next portion of code we're going to do all the mathematics. So we've got our angle going right here and that creates 12 segments and in each segment you're going to want to place your plane in the right position but also rotate it so this first portion these first two lines actually place your planes around the carousel and the last one actually rotates them into correct position let me draw that so you can get an idea of what's going on imagine that you have a carousel here and you have these different positions of 12 around the carousel imagine there's 12 of these 
And so the first part of the code, actually what it does, it places the planes around the carousel. But they're not in the right rotational configuration. Remember when you want to do, put something in a circle, you use sines and cosines. So you multiply cosine times the plane radius and sine times the plane radius. And it puts them all around the circle. But now you want to rotate them into the right place. So the problem is that you've placed your planes around this circle. Okay? Like so. With the first two lines of code. But they're not tangent around your circle. You actually want these planes to be flush. You actually have to rotate them a little bit in angle here. And so this is what this rotation Y does. It actually rotates your plane around the circle so it's actually tangent to that circle. And that's exactly what it does. So it's very simple code. And you might be asking, hey, look at this line of code here. How did you come up with this, Mike? Are you really smart? And the answer is no. I knew that I had to do a rotation Y to get everything tangent to the circle. I knew it was 360 divided by the number of particles times I, but I didn't quite know what this number was here, you know, to get the uh, overall, basically, calibration for the circle. So how did I come up with that number? Well, I just played around. I know that's kind of sounding funny, but it's called emotional programming. And just for a few minutes, I just typed in a few different numbers, and eventually all my planes were flush. And I said, that's it. Let's go on. And so uh, simple way of programming. And sometimes you just do that where you're on autopilot and you're just punching in numbers and, hey, it works. All right, let's finish the rest of this program. And we've just gone through how the angles and the planes were created. And once those uh, planes are created and their angles are set right, you're going to put them into the uh, array, particle array. And once they're in the particle array, you'll be able to place them on the stage. We'll show you how to do it in a moment. But the important thing that's going on here is you're actually counting the number of uh, planes that you're creating. Because when you get the final plane, then you want to uh, basically set everything into your display object and then set everything into motion. So let's take a look at that real quick. Go down a little bit in the code. So after you've created your final plane, you've pushed it into your particle array and you've thrown it into your display object. So what you want to do is go ahead and add that display object to the stage. Then you're going to set its rotation to zero. Then you're going to set its center. And finally, what you want to do is start up your add listener, and that's going to start your frame loop for your animation. And we're going to scroll down here just a little bit more. And by adding the listener, basically you run this method on every frame. So we've looked at this method previously, and just the one line of code that we didn't look at here was the display.rotation. This will rotate the entire display container thus causing my planes to rotate without having to iterate through each one. I have this center x here and I subtract it from my mouse position and multiply it by some factor of acceleration. And I just add that to the rotation constantly so it allows my carousel to rotate one way or the other depending on where my mouse is on the screen. And then I want to run this uh, sort particles method. So now let's take a look at our sort method. We've uncommented the sort particles so we can actually run the sort method. And uh, here's the sort method right here. And in the first part of the method, what we're going to actually do is do a particle sort on the particle Z method. And then once we've done the sort, then we're going to tick through all our particles and rearrange them according to their position using add child at. So uh, you've already seen methods like this one before, so you should understand what this means. We're going to basically take the particle name and add it to i as a sprite. But how does the particle z method work? This is kind of new to us. And to see that, I'm actually going to take you right to the text. So we're in chapter one of the book where we actually discuss this method. And what we're looking at right now is this portion of code right here where we actually work with this sorting function, this particle z sort. So how does this work? The particle array sort method passes the particle z sort function as a parameter. Now that's pretty cool right here. Isn't that cool? This method is the parameter of the sort method. The particle z sort function is called multiple times with pairs of particles during a sort returning a negative number if the first particle should be placed in front of the second. The matrix 3D and vector 3D methods are used to keep track of your object's position. So with that said, let's go back and take a look at the code. So we're back in the code and we're looking at this particles z sort method, which is a parameter of the particle sort method. 
And what we're doing is we're actually grabbing these positions Z1 and Z2 of the two different panels and we're using the transform.matrix.position uh, method. So basically we can get the position of any display object using the matrix.position transform method. So this is really important because previously we've been keeping track of particles based upon mathematics and where we think they should be. But here if you don't know where a particle is you can actually use this simple line of code here to find its position. And once you find the position for one and two you actually just subtract them and as was said previously if it's negative you sort them if not you don't so pretty cool and uh, that's how it works let's run it one more time and that's how you make a simple carousel well this was Mike Lively and I'll see you next time and we're gonna look at an image ball